Chapter 1 In a third-floor office on a city side street, shadowed by a tall building reeking of regret, petite blonde Sam leaned her tight jeans against George's cold metal desk, waiting for his reply. The room smelled of strong cologne, and the walls around them were cheap wood paneling peppered with tiny holes from years of being used as a pincushion for paper notes. The heavy-set man with gray hair reached for a pink pencil eraser without even noticing Sam's loose-fitting white t-shirt revealed what was underneath it. But she noticed him. You ever thought about wearing anything but button-ups, George? She asked, studying the fake pearl snap buttons on his short sleeve off his shirt. Without taking his eyes off his paperwork, George asked, You like horror movies, Sam? They're okay. What do you think of this? He slid a photo from a movie towards her. Looks gross, replied Sam. Yeah, I know. I got it from a guy out west who's been running it at drive-ins. He says the farm kids go crazy for it. I'm thinking of double billing it with that slasher movie we've been running. So, why do you want tattoos? I thought you didn't hear me, George. I always hear you, Sam. What's the deal with wanting them? I want one. One right here on my arm down my shoulder where it peeks out from underneath the sleeve a bit. So it's visible, but not too visible. You know what I mean? Yeah, but why do you want it? Your arm looks perfect the way it is. Jody says I look too innocent to work a sidewalk hustle. She says I need to be tough. And look where that got her, commented George, doing some quick math on a notepad. She's 42 with stretch marks and tan that doesn't hide them. You're twenty-something, with pale skin and a heart-shaped derriere. Derry what? It's French for butt. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks for that, continued Sam. But I draw attention to myself, George. You're the way God made you, Sam. That's what my mom says. She's a smart lady. Okay, he said, sliding her a new sheet of paper with words on it. I'm thinking of this for the sign on the theater. What do you think? Sam turned her head to read the sheet. How do you come up with this stuff, George? My dad was better than me at it, replied George, turning from her to peer up at the framed picture of his father. Dad started managing theaters when he was 15. Bought his first one at 25. The man was a genius at movie promotion. A lot of people stare at me, George. He spun around. Isn't that a good thing in your line of work? I had a guy comment the other day on my odd size. What's he call odd? asked George, using the eraser to rub out numbers in a counting ledger. I once knew a guy that was seven feet two inches tall. He could change the letters on a marquee without needing a ladder, just a footstool. He ended up getting a role in a famous monster movie where he played the monster. Today he lives near the ocean and owns a chain of hotels. Sometimes it pays to be different. I don't know, moaned Sam, pushing away from the desk. I'm just tired of thinking people think I'm too short. Then stop thinking it. Be confident. Imagine you're tall, George smiled, placing the eraser down. Sam rolled her eyes. Easy for you to say. You don't have to be out there. George eased back in his chair. Anybody else said it? No. Then why do you care what the world thinks? I've been in this business for a long time, and I've been fat for a long time, too. If I cared about my looks, I'd be broke. Sam chuckled. I see your point. Thanks. It's good to have your own insults be approved. Sam started towards the door. Hey. What? She asked, slouching. Don't let Jody get to you. She's lost a lot in life and angry at the world. You get into trouble out there, you give me a call. Okay. I mean it. If you have problems, come see me. Thanks, George. I'll see you around. Hope the movie goes well. Me too, he said to himself. Chapter 2 Unsure about George's answer, Sam found herself an hour later resting on the sidewalk outside a bookstore while street vagabond Bert, draped in a mover's blanket, stained with the grime of countless alleys, stumbled around clasping a bottle of cheap rum. Behind him, a long wall of brown brick buildings blocked the view of the blue sky and stretched from side to side for what seemed to be miles. Sam peered up at Bert with a bewilderment reserved for a clumsy circus clown daring to walk a tightrope. 
against the facade of brown brick with the mover's blanket shrouding his face, Bert had the appearance of a wise old sage adorned in a castle cloak. Listen to me, said Bert, pausing to hunch over her. George might look like a troll from under the bridge, but the man knows his stuff. You know what he said, Bert? He said that nobody cares about my size. Nobody but you, Sam, replied Bert, stepping back and spinning on one foot. What do you plan on doing with yourself? Plan on spinning all day glum in the dumps over something stupid? Sam lowered her head and picked at the toe of her sneaker. She rolled her finger around the soft loops of the strings and pinched a knot. Where's your cactus, Bert? He stopped stumbling. Died two weeks ago. I've been kind of out of it. The cactus died? Yeah. How? I thought they lived forever. How do you know it's dead? I was dancing around to a jazz album up in this dude's apartment, bumped up against it, and accidentally knocked it out a window. It splattered on the sidewalk. Sam looked at her shoe. I'm burned out on this hustle, Bert. I want to leave. Why don't we leave the city? suggested Sam. No, 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 replied Bert. And go out to the country. I have family on the plains. We could raise a garden and grow all the cactus plants you want. Can't do that, Sam. This is my home. Been here all my life. I don't have anything much, but I got this. He waved his arm in the air. The city is my stage. That punker chick with the silver pants is shorter, commented Sam. She's shorter than me. She's a punk rocker for sure. I see her down at the hardcore clubs in combat boots and leather. She's always hanging around with those bruised knuckle chain punks smoking and drinking warm beer. She's got a tattoo, Bert, a big fat tattoo of a palm tree on her left hand. She's the only person I ever seen with a tattoo on her hand. She's the only person I ever seen with a palm tree for a tat, commented Bert, taking a sip off the aging bottle of rum. What's going to happen if I get tats, Bert? Bert lowered the bottle. He thought for a second before wiping his lips with the back of his hand. I don't know, Sam. I don't have any. And my life hasn't gotten any worse or better. I'm simply cruising along like a jet. Maybe nothing will happen. Chapter 3 Relaxed in the shadows of a cozy coffee diner, Sam watched tall, long-legged Daisy stir her coffee. Nearby, a loud throat-clearing cough caught her attention. Sam turned and noticed two large men staring at Daisy. City workers, scoffed Daisy. Possibly garbage collectors. The men sat at a small table, smoking and enjoying thick white mugs of coffee. One of the men noticed Sam staring. He aimed his eyes on her and took a long drag off a cigarette and released the cannon plume of smoke towards her. Spellbound by the trash? asked Daisy. Sam smiled. George is from the gutter, Sam. Why do you hang out with him? He's nice to me. He's old, Sam. Old like Grandfather Old. Reaching down, Daisy pulled her purple-pink miniskirt to her knees. I'll never again buy clothing from that store over by the laundry. Whatever they made these shorts out of seems to be shrinking as I sweat. George is nice to me, Daisy. That's why I like him. Shut up, Sam. He's too old to date and too old to try. Probably too old to care, too. What do you think of red dresses? They're okay. I gotta buy something for a wedding. My aunt's marrying a guy she met three weeks ago. Can you imagine marrying a person you met three weeks ago at a casino? No, I've never been to a casino. Daisy sighed and plucked her spoon from her coffee. See, that's your problem, Sam. You know nothing. Daisy took a pleasant sip as she kept an eye on the sidewalk through a large window. Then I'd tone it down. Make it a maroon, since it's a wedding, said Sam. Yeah, agreed Daisy biting her lip and rubbing her finger along the rim of the cup. But I really like red. But then again, I see your point. Sam took her eyes off Daisy and looked once more at the men sitting close by. Weddings are nice, commented Sam. Weddings are like funerals. Sam turned quickly to join the conversation. You don't want to overdo it, said Daisy, lifting her cup to take a sip. So about those tats, why do you want them? You're the first person to ask me that, replied Sam, slouching to show contempt for Daisy being the first. Daisy aimed her gaze on Sam's sad expression. 
Look at me, nymph. I've never been called that. Shut up and look at me. Sam perked up. What? You're getting advice from all over the city, but not looking in the mirror for the opinion that counts. Now tell me, you got any advice on shoes? Sam burst into laughter. You're crazy, Daisy. One minute your aunt, the next me, the next shoes. Yeah, well. Hills look nice, but suck in mud, replied Sam. Yeah, and I don't want to be one of those muddy-toed ladies walking around holding a glass of wine in one hand with a pair of spikes in the other while I pretend I'm having a great time. Daisy returned to the street window. Man, why does this have to be so complex? You could go as you do at work. Daisy grinned at the thought. If they'd pay me, I would. My runway step's been terrible lately. I got scheduled a month ago at that new club downtown. The one with the dancing stars out front. Dude spent a fortune on those neon stars. Inside looks nice too. Red carpet and velvet ropes leading into the joint. The place smells like coconut tanning lotion. I love coconut tanning lotion. You ever smelled the kind they blend with watermelon? Shut up, Sam. I'm not done talking. You know, continued Daisy, high technology makes them work. Anyway, it took six weeks to get the manager to let me on stage. Then like that, out of the blue, they canceled my booking at the last minute. I'm as broke as a bad joke. Sam leaned back in the bench and stretched out to dig into her tight front pant pocket. Everything okay? What are you doing? asked Daisy. Sam pulled out a wrinkled five-dollar bill and placed it on the table next to Daisy's coffee. What's that? asked Daisy. Money for you, replied Sam, using the palms of her hands to iron the note flat. Daisy stared at the five-dollar bill, slowly recoiling back to its wrinkles, and took a final sip of her coffee. Keep your money, Sam. I gotta get going. Chapter 4 from the sidewalk, Sam rolled a sheet of paper into a tube and pressed it to the glass of a large bookstore window to form a spy tunnel for peering in. Through the tunnel, she observed patrons discreetly milling around shelves of magazines. Stepping back, she reached for the metal handle of the bookstore's door and pulled it open. Inside, she walked through a small hallway that angled into the interior of the room where it opened up to travel back to a larger part. Few men lingered about the shelves, noticing her pass through to the center staircase leading down to a lower floor where Robert, the owner, held court with friends along a wooden counter. Seeing Sam come down the steps, Robert cut off his talking. Well, look who it is! As she walked to the counter, the men backed away so as to form a place for her to stand in front of Robert. Without saying a word, Sam placed a sheet of paper on his flat, smooth surface. The men leaned in to get a look. What is this? asked Robert. Designs for my tattoos, replied Sam. This one is a rose with a diamond dripping blood, and this one is a desert cactus. Now why do you want tattoos, Sam? asked Robert. Explain it to me and the fellows in a way that won't make me think I'm not going to ask a question. Impossible. You always have questions, Robert. She's a smart one, Robbie. This one here, said a large man, excusing himself. Sam smiled at the compliment and concluded, Everybody's getting them, Robert. Yes, and losing work. How is that possible, Robert? I thought men like tattoos. They do. But not when everybody has them. Look, Sam, I'm not against you getting them. But your niche is the way you look now at this moment in time. I look weak, Robert. Who says? If I thought you looked weak, I'd say it. Besides, as long as you got me and the fellows on your side, you got an army. I should be a rocker chick. They look tough. Got all those spikes and stuff. I need some spikes. You got spikes, Robert? Spikes? Asked one of the men. What's she talking about? You know, said another. Those leather bracelet things the kids wear. Those ugly things? Asked the inquiring man. Someone's been spending too much time watching the freak shows down by the station. Sam interjected Robert. You do not need to be tough. You do not need spikes. What you need is to be smart. You mad, Robert? I'm not mad, Sam, but I'm perplexed. The world's changed. When my father started this business, it wasn't even legal to sell our movies. Everyone fought for it to be, and now that it is, and established, a whole new generation with no connection wants to run us out of town. In a low tone, a large man spoke softly to Sam Zier. Now we got to be like foxes, always looking. Always walking softly, as if there is snow beneath our feet. 
Sam peered up. What a pleasant thought. My mother used to say it. My mother has kind sayings too, said Sam. My mother died many years ago, he added. I'm sorry to hear it. She sounds like she was a very nice lady. Sam, interrupted Robert. Yes? Forget the tattoo. Chapter 5 Thin-faced Harry sat in his office on the first floor of a dingy hotel forgotten by progress. Lime green carpet on the floor and sunlight glowing through a row of decorated glass cubes running along a white brick wall flaking paint were the only light source illuminating the dim space made murky by chain-smoked cigarettes. On his wooden desk, cluttered by disorganized paperwork and crumpled packs of smokes, a blue rotary dial phone poked up as the only signal of technology existing beyond the room. The phone, perched on his shoulder and pressed to his ear, allowed him to grow granny ash cigarettes that charred the lime green carpet. At the base of his tan neck, two white collars winged out. In the gap below, a gold medallion glistened. Spite of tan, noticeable yellow stains of nicotine showed between his fingers. As Sam entered the room, her body broke the sunbeams shone in the fog of gray smoke and stirred the air into swirls. Harry spun his chair to lose eye contact with her and focused on the brick wall to his side. Well, he's right about that, said Harry, winding down this conversation. Yeah, dudes now would rather admit they hate a person. He peered at Sam, who sat in a red chair covering her nose. Hey, let me call you back. Someone just walked in. Spinning to his desk, Harry dropped the phone onto the receiver. What's up, Sam? You sick? You smoke too much, she said in a muffled voice. Harry grinned and ground the cigarette out in a dirty ashtray. Sam unfolded her legs and became direct. I'm thinking of getting a tattoo, Harry. What do you think about that? Going to get those tats, are you? He asked, reaching for a pack of cigarettes. How do you know? I don't, he said, tapping out a loose smoke. But you just told me you're wanting one. Everybody wants them. Well, Jody says there's money in it. I'll look street tough and be able to lean against walls. You can't lean against walls now, asked Harry, gripping the cigarette between his lips as he reached for paper matches. You know, they don't require a degree for that. I'm serious, Harry. He struck a match. Me too, he said, shaking out the flame. You should try chewing a toothpick. A toothpick? They work in the westerns. Every good western has a mysterious man who chews a toothpick, he winked. I'm not a man. Yeah, I guess. The world's full of mysteries, he commented, placing the cooling match in the ashtray. Sam scowled. Stop being funny, Harry. I didn't walk all the way down here to have you tease me. Harry relaxed and said silent before saying, Jody can't find a job, Sam, and it has nothing to do with tattoos or looking tough. She's been on my case for weeks now to help her score a better hustle. You don't like Jody, do you, Harry? I'll be honest with you, Sam. Ever since she went to the desert, I've not cared much for her attitude. She came back thinking she knows everything. She uses big words to get her points across. Problem is, she doesn't. I can't understand the thing she's talking about. So I just sit there, bobbing my head like one of those toy dogs people place on the dash of their cars. You ever seen one? Yeah. Well, that's what I feel like, said Harry, leaning forward and flicking an ash. I just bob my head and hope she leaves. That's mean, Harry. Well, it's true, he shouted. I know she's your friend. But she's not doing you or herself any favors by trying to pretend she's 25 years old when she's 48. George says she's 42. 42, 48, what's a few years matter when you're pushing 50? Taking a long drag, he stood abruptly and walked out to sit on the edge of his desk. Look, Sam, there's lots of bad advice out there. Take it from me, and take it from this. Pulling up his pant leg, Harry showed her a terrible scar. Wow, how did that happen? I was a bit loose one night on cheap plastic liquor bottles. What's that have to do with me wanting tattoos? It happened because I followed bad advice. Whole city is full of bad advice, he continued. It makes people second-guess themselves. Harry paused and pinched the last bit of smoke from his fledgling cigarette before adding it to the pile in the ashtray. If you want those tattoos, he said, you'll talk yourself into getting them. But as they're stinging you with the needle, you'll be asking yourself why you are. And by then, it's too late. Harry reached down for the pack of cigarettes. You got it all figured out, don't you, Harry? No, he replied, tossing the pack on his desk. But I've been at it a long time. Rolling the new cigarette between his fingers, he continued with, Any more, Sam? 
I don't make an important decision without thinking about what I'm going to tell myself later when I wish I hadn't. Chapter 6 This all you got? shouted Meade. High above a city street in a ratty apartment, Sam dug her hand deep into her tight pants pocket and pulled out a wad of warm money to place in Meade's smooth palm. What do you do all day out there, Sam? Hustle? Hustle? he asked, inspecting the money. You call this hustle money? You'd make more money begging for change. I'm sorry, Meade. I heard you were out there talking to that misfit Bert. He's my friend, Meade. Friend? A boozer with a cactus is your friend? Are you stupid, Sam? Meade leaned in close, pressing his nose inches from her face. I'm your friend, he said, forcefully jamming his finger into her chest. I'm all you got. Ouch! Stop it, Meade. That hurts. I'm your friend, he said again, poking her harder. Where's the rest of your money? Dig out those pockets. You're hurting me, Meade. Stop it. Empty your pockets. I don't have any more. Chapter 7 With his briefcase in hand, George tugged open the door to the building housing his office and left a gleaming glow of break of day outside. In the dim confines, he proceeded inward to trudge the three-story climb leading up to the hallway connecting his world to the world beyond the city. His morning routine was to hum a song as he placed his foot firmly on the first step. The tune was inconsequential, but always the same catchy jingle he heard on an overnight radio commercial as a teen. Over the years, his mind added more to it until finally it played out as a continuous loop of nothing more than an endless song hummed when he needed to concentrate. One flight finished, he turned and began to the next flight of stairs. All the while, he hummed a jingle and prepared to fumble his keys as the midpoint in the third set of stairs marked a change. Sorting his keys, George arrived at the floor leading to his office. As was his custom, he looked to his right and next his left, where his office door was near a large window. Out of the norm, something caught his attention. From the distance, the strange shape appeared to be a limp bag propped against the corner. But as he inched forward with subtle progress, it gradually became clear the lump was not a bag. It was Sam, bloody and battered. I didn't have enough money moaned Sam. George crouched down beside her. Who did this to you, Sam? Me wanted the money. Me did this to you? He asked, examining her face. You know me? No, no, I don't, he replied, helping her up. But let's get into my office. Chapter 8 Reaching down, George yanked open a drawer on his desk. The assortment of colored bottles slid forward to collide with the drawer's outer surface. George! Pushing the side aspirin, he picked up a brown glass bottle containing ivory white tablets. George! Unscrewing the lid, he tapped out two pills into his palm. George! On my way, Sam. It was me, George, said Sam, staring up at George from his couch. He beat me up. Now you mentioned that. I don't know him. George held the dose out to her. What are they? She questioned, pinching the pills from his palm. They'll make you feel better. My face is on fire, George. The pills will help. Time will do the rest. Skinny guy tall, added Sam, popping the pills into her mouth. I met me when I got off the bus. He your friend? Not anymore, she replied, swallowing hard. A kind expression followed her answer as George walked back to his desk with the bottle. I'm thinking of going back home, George. Get some rest. We'll talk later, he said, placing the pills into the drawer. Chapter 9 The wide tips of Sam's smooth sole sneakers walked the sidewalk, stopping at a grimy blanket clumped against a brick wall. I see you got a new cactus. Yeah. They were going to throw it out. I saved it. Bert poked his head out into the light to see Sam's face. Wow! 
Throwing off the blanket, he bounced up to get a closer inspection. You look terrible. What happened? Meade beat me up for not making enough money. Meade? questioned Bert. He's dead. Dead? The beer drunks found him in the river, he added, reaching down for the blanket. Dead? Are you sure, Bert? Word on the street is he's dead, he continued, wrapping the blanket around his shoulders. I haven't got proof, but the streets don't usually lie. What do you think of my new cactus? It's nice, Bert, she replied, trailing off into thought. Hey, you okay, Sam? Yeah, I just need to get going. Chapter 10 He sure did a number on you, Sam, commented Jody, scooting into the red diner bench. It's like having the tattoo of a dead man on my face, replied Sam, sliding in beside her. Well, I wouldn't be that dramatic about it, added Jody, digging through her purse. Waiter, two coffees here, and bring me some milk. This is crazy, Jody. What am I going to do? I like milk, Sam. You like milk? I bet a pretty girl like you probably does. It's okay. Find a new meat, replied Jody, flipping open a small cosmetic mirror. I'll set you up with this guy I know, she continued, checking her face. Nice guy. She snapped the mirror closed and dropped it into her purse. I have no idea how you manage without a purse. I practically live in mine. Mead was all I had, Jody. Hey, don't cry. As soon as I finish a cup of coffee, I'll jump up and make that call. You'll have a new place to stay tonight. I don't want a new place, replied Sam. I'm going home. Home? That's metaphorical, right? Meta what? You're leaving the city. What else would I be talking about? Chapter 11 Defeated, Sam walked the sidewalk and determined silence as Jody trailed behind her. You got any money, Sam? Sam remained silent. Bus tickets ain't cheap, Sam. Sam remained steadfast. Here, take this. Snake biting Sam's wrist, she forced the girl's palm open and jammed a wad of money into it. Crimping the money, Sam turned. I can't take your money, Jody. Don't be a small town girl, Sam. Take this money and add some to it. Sam looked into her hand and then turned to see Jody rushing away from her. Jody, called Sam, beginning to chase. Jody, I can't take your money. The distance increased between, Jody, take your money. The space between them became wider. Jody, Sam slowed and stopped. She looked down at the money and to herself said, I won't forget you, Jody. Chapter 12 Splitting town, are you? George peered at Sam from over his desk. From his couch, she replied back, I'm not cut out for this. Can you help me? He leaned back in his chair. I have a theater two blocks over near that bar with the giant neon cocktail glass that flashes blue and pink. The guy who runs it for me needs help. I was thinking you might want to help him. Working at a theater, asked Sam. Sure. If you don't like it, you at least make enough money to get a bus ticket out of here. Doing what? Whatever it takes. Cleaning? Helping with the projector? Learning the ropes? He's a nice guy. He'll teach you. I don't know, George. Last real job I had was pushing a broom in my aunt's feed store. Well, you've already got one qualification down. Yeah, but she fired me for eating brownies. We don't serve brownies. Sammy's back into the couch cushion. I don't know, George. It sounds tempting, but I just don't know. There's a room upstairs in the theater you can stay in. No strings attached. No funny business. I'll throw it into the deal, rent-free. Really? Well, it's nothing to brag about, but it's a roof. Has electricity and it's safe. Nobody will mess with you there. It's where we store movies and supplies. I'll have some guys bring you up a cot and whatever you might need. You want an answer now? No. What if I want to try it? I'll say okay. What if I don't? I'll give you the extra for the bus ticket and wish you well. What if I start and want out? No strings attached, Sam, he reminded, turning his attention to the paperwork on his desk. You can leave any time you want. Rising from the couch, Sam approached George's desk. What kind of movies do you show there? 
Reaching for a yellow folder, he held it up to her. Sam took the folder and started back to the couch. Oh, wow. She spun around to face him. You show these? All day except for two, he replied. We used the two hours to kick the lights on and clean the place. I'll do it. The End Sam's Tattoo, written by Brooks Kohler, published by Brooks Kohler in 2022 for the purpose of adding the story to the Internet Archive. This story is fiction. Similarities to any person, living or deceased, are coincidence.